So my name is Emily. I am here from um, from Vancouver Island, and um, today we're going to be talking about the killer whales that are off BC's coast, um, and talking about why, in particular, um, one species, the southern resident uh, population, is doing so much more poorly uh, than the others. So who here has seen a killer whale in the wild? Was that killer whale in British Columbia? Who knew that there was different types of killer whales before today? Yeah, some of you, okay, great. So there's actually 10 different types of killer whales around the world. Um, they actually just discovered a new one, so we, if that's verified, we might be looking at 11, which is very cool. Um, and so we have four different types off the coast of British Columbia, and we're gonna be talking about them today, doing a kind of a compare and contrast here. Um, and then we're also going to be looking at um, why the southern residents, one of these four populations, is doing so much worse than the other ones, um, which is crazy considering they've got overlap in habitat and they're actually still part of the same um, group of animals. Um, so I am um, from the Whale Interpretive Center that's on the northern part of Vancouver Island um, and so I'm really fortunate to have spent a lot of time around these animals and so um, a lot of the photos you'll see in the presentation today um, I took or other researchers from that area took. So first off, to kind of clear killer whale versus orca, um, this is a movie poster from a horror movie that came out in the 1980s that really colored public perception about killer whales for a long time. I also like to use it because of the ridiculously <laughs> contradictory name, orca, the killer whale. Um, so killer whale came from killer of whales. Some species of killer whales we're gonna discuss today do consume other species of marine mammal. Um, orca, a lot of people use to try and like get around, they think, like, oh, killer whale sounds so scary, let's use orca instead. Well, orca actually means one or creature from the underworld or from hell, so you're not really dodging it either way. The scientific community uses both, of course, orca is from, coming from the Latin, um, so you can use either. I mostly use killer whale. Um, in my experience, the scientific community mostly uses killer whale, but both are totally acceptable. So let's start off with our Biggs killer whales. So Biggs killer whales used to be called transient killer whales. Um, the name was changed to Biggs for Dr. Michael Big, um, who is kind of the grandfather of killer whale research. Um, and so you can see, as in our photo here by researcher Jared Towers, um, this guy is headbutting a doll's porpoise out of the water. Um, that is not a baby killer whale. The black and white is misleading, um, but it's a porpoise. And these guys are eating other species of marine mammals as well, including seals, sea lions, dolphins, other types of porpoises, as well as the calves of larger whales like humpbacks and like gray whales. Um, these guys have a huge range, somewhere between central California all the way up to southeast Alaska, um, and they're not very vocal. They're usually in smaller groups. And this all makes sense because if you think about, um, you know, having a big group that's really, really chatty, that's not really going to do well to sneak up on your prey. So that makes sense as to why they're always moving. The offshore killer whales are a really interesting group. Um, we don't know a whole lot about these animals because as the name suggests, they live farther offshore. Um, and this makes it really hard to study because you think about the budget that's required to put a research vessel together and head out into the wide open ocean to research these animals as compared to a species like the other ones we're gonna talk about today that are oftentimes less than a kilometer from the shore. Um, these animals eat sharks, and usually um, I make people guess what they eat based on the filed down teeth. Those teeth on that deceased individual are flush with the gum line, and that's because shark skin is actually, it feels like sandpaper. It's really, really rough, and so as these animals age, their teeth get filed down. Because these animals are so cooperative, um, they help older members of the group feed, so this isn't a death sentence for them. Um, these animals are in big groups, and they're very, very vocal. Again, um, because you don't have to worry about sneaking up on a shark. Sharks can't hear very well. Today we're going to be really focusing on this group here, the resident killer whales. And resident killer whales eat salmon. Um, if you went whale watching in British Columbia, this is probably who the star of the show was. Um, and when I talk about what these animals are eating, um, it's a very unique animal in that these animals are pretty much exclusively eating what we're talking about. So we know this because in the 1970s when we were still capturing killer whales for aquariums, um, we accidentally captured some big type killer whales, those mammal eating killer whales. Of course, we didn't know there was a difference at that point and we tried to feed them fish and these individuals actually starved to death in captivity before they would take the fish. So that's how absolute their diets is. So when I say these animals eat salmon, they eat salmon. We're gonna talk about uh, decreasing salmon populations here in a minute and why that's a problem for these guys. And a lot of people in the media say, oh, I don't understand why they don't just eat seals. 
they will not eat seals. They will likely go extinct before they eat seals. That's how serious these animals are about their dietary restrictions. Um, these animals are very vocal. Salmons don't have good hearing. They can chat as much as they like. And you know they are living in big family groups. And again, as we talked about with those big killer whales, that's reflective of what they're eating. Um, resident is misleading. Um, definitely do your research if you want to come visit British Columbia and see killer whales, because resident certainly does not mean that they have a permanent home. There's two types of northern uh, of resident killer whales, northern and southern. Um, the main difference with these animals is that we have different languages in each. So within um, A clan, uh, G clan, and R clan in the northern population, the southern residents we have J, K, and L. The major difference between them is just their range. So they're all eating salmon. The southern residents, obviously, further south around the Gulf Islands, around the city of uh, Seattle and Vancouver. The northern residents, um, but anywhere between northern to central Vancouver Island, all the way up to southeast Alaska. Um, and of course, the population is hugely different. As you can see, first bullet there, the northern residents at 309 individuals and the southern residents at 74. So we're going to listen to some killer whale vocalizations. Please excuse the tackiness of my cell phone. Um, and so we're going to be listening to the northern residents, A, G, and R. And this is an amazing, amazing tool. We can hear these animals underwater on a hydrophone for up to 11 kilometers away. So if we see killer whales way away on the horizon, we can't get a visual identification, we can put a hydrophone in the water and we can listen to them and identify them, at least their family group, based on the language, which is so cool. So today we're going to listen to A clan first, A, G, and R. Um, and this is also really important for inbreeding purposes. So if I'm an A clan killer whale, I'm only going to breed with a G or an R clan, not another A. So this prevents me from breeding with anybody I'm related with. Um, it should also be noted that killer whales only breed within their types, within their ecotypes. So a Biggs killer whale is not going to breed uh, with a resident or uh, an offshore. So let's listen to A clan. Next is G-Clan. These guys sound a little bit different. I always kind of think they sound like donkeys. These guys sound really different. Uh, next is R-Clan. Kind of listen for some snorting in R-Clan. They're kind of famous for that. Um, so next is our southern residents. So I just have one sample for you. Keep in mind there is three languages just like in the northern residents there. There's J, K, and L. I've got J sampled for you today. Um, and the J clan language is what was actually used um, in the movie Free Willy. Um, so if you hear those vocalizations there, this is J clan. Ironically, of course, the animal from uh, Free Willy was Keiko, and Keiko's from Iceland. So not at all the language he would have spoken. Okay. And then lastly, we have the Biggs killer whales. And you'll notice these guys are a lot less chatty, again, wanting to maintain that element of surprise for their prey. Um, this is what they sound like. I don't have a sample today of the um, offshore killer whales, but a lot of people talk about them sounding like horses. They're very high pitched. And a lot of people say as soon as they hear them, they go, oh, that sounds like a dolphin. Of course, killer whales being the largest uh, member of the dolphin family. So that definitely uh, makes sense. So for comparative populations here, I just want to really drive home really how much smaller the southern residents are. Um, and they're the only population that is actively decreasing. Um, the <laughs> offshore killer whale number, we don't really have a good population count on them, um, but we do believe it's increasing and stable. Um, and really what we're going to talk about next here is, is how is this possible? How on earth did this happen? These animals share a home range. They're members of the same species. And why is one group suffering so much more? So right away, off the bat, in a nutshell, these animals spend too much time around people. It's their home range is the root of the problem. These animals live in a really, really populated area. We're talking about millions of people living in this area. Those are all major cities. They're all major shipping ports. Um, and so we're going to talk about a number of problems that stems from this, but this is the real root of the problem. 
So decreasing salmon, I mentioned this a little bit before. This is a really controversial issue. A lot of people have a, a lot of different opinions on this. Um, this is especially controversial in British Columbia. And depending on who you talk to, they'll give you a different answer. Realistically, as with most things, it's probably a combination of all of them. The end of this whole thing is, though, salmon populations are decreasing and killer whales are suffering as a result. Problem number two is linked to the decrease in food resources. Um, chemical pollutants are a major problem. These animals are at the top of the food chain, which means bioaccumulation is a big problem for them. Um, this is especially difficult on fetuses and nursing calves. Um, so with these animals, we're gonna see huge, huge levels of contamination. Um, the photograph here you can see, do I have a laser here? No, okay. Um, is that little, that head peeking up is a deceased calf. Um, and that's mom, J35, pushing that calf. Um, she carried it over a thousand kilometers over 17 days. Um, and so this speaks to the emotional intelligence of these animals, which is a whole nother presentation and very complicated and super cool. Um, but it also speaks to how acute these toxins are to these animals. And it's, it's kind of an interesting thing in that it's linked with lack of food. If these animals had a lot of food, even though the food is what is poisoning them, they don't need to metabolize their blubber where the toxins are stored. So it's just like you having toxic insulation in your house. As long as you're not eating your insulation, it doesn't matter that it's toxic. And if these animals had enough food, if they had enough salmon, um, they wouldn't need to metabolize their blubber. Of course, for a female that's nursing, that blubber gets turned into milk, and so it's very fatty. Um, and as a result of this, we have not had a successful birth that's lasted over two months in the last three years. Um, we've had one in February of this year, um, but we're still only a few weeks out from that, so we'll see. Problem number three is noise pollution. Um, and a lot of people, after I talk about they're starving to death, they're being poisoned, they go, oh, noise pollution, that's not that big of a deal. But it is, because it contributes to the other issues. It's more stressful for these animals to exist, so things like mating are disrupted by that. Um, and it's also going to be more difficult for them to coordinate hunting if they can't hear each other um, over the noise. Um, and this is kind of an interesting thing that people dispute this, because how many of you ask your realtor, you know, I want two bedrooms, and I want to get as close to the highway as I possibly can. Nobody asks for that. And so, of course, it makes sense that killer whales don't like extra noise in their environment. Um, but it's kind of a double-edged thing because, um, you know, we want to make people passionate about it. We want to make people excited about it. Um, Steve Irwin talks about making people fall in love with wildlife. Um, and people want to protect what they love. So with these animals, we want to get people out there on the water. We want to get people excited about them. But that comes at the cost of increased boat traffic. Problem number four is kind of interesting, it's historic live captures. This was done in Washington State and British Columbia in the Gulf Islands um, for many years in the 70s and even up into the 80s. Um, we don't know how many individuals were taken in live captures um, because they unfortunately, to decrease controversy of this, they would sink carcasses. So we don't have a good idea. We think about 40 individuals were taken to aquariums, but we don't really know how many totally were taken out of the population. Unfortunately, this still goes on today, not in British Columbia, um, but in uh, Russia, we had a number of individuals of killer whales caught for the Sochi Olympics, and they're actually recently caught a huge number of belugas and killer whales. So you can check that out. That was in the news recently. Um, so unfortunately, this still goes on around the world. So why don't these issues impact northern resident killer whales? Here am I going on about the southern residents and it's in the news and all this kind of stuff. Well, they do, but think about where southern residents live in the Bear, Great Bear Rainforest. There's so few people there. And so these issues absolutely affect the northern resident killer whales. Without a doubt, they affect all the killer whales around the world, all 10 types, right around 50,000 individual killer whales um, across all the populations. But this, is, this individual, I took this photo, um, that A66, he's 23 years old, his name's Surf. We know all these animals as individuals, and you can see there's no boats in the background there. That's in Johnson Strait, um, on the east side of Vancouver Island. That's it. There's no people, there's no boats. It's really a different environment. Even though these animals are so, so similar, they're facing massive issues just because of where they live, and the northern residents escape that because most of their habitat is relatively untouched by people. Um, and so we should really use this as a wake-up call. We should not assume, go like, huh, man, southern residents kind of uh, 
drew the short straw on the environment that's a bummer no this could happen to any killer whale population if tomorrow iceland or norway was the most populated country on the planet then those killer whales would be affected it's just that it happens to be where people live are where these animals are most damaged and so there's lots of things that we can do to help these animals there's huge campaigns going on lots of federal and provincial funds being allocated but it really needs a cultural change because a lot of just our day to day life is what's impact impacting these animals Thank you so much for listening. Um, we do have time for some questions here. If you have questions, otherwise my email's there. If you think of something later, please contact me. As you can tell, I'm happy to talk about killer whales anytime. Um, if you are interested in this stuff, there's tons of great resources. Um, definitely feel free to just give a quick Google. There's lots of stuff in print and online. And if you're around Vancouver Island this summer, don't hesitate to drop by the Well Interpretive Center. Thank you so much, everybody.